Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today we're continuing to fly down helicopter lane with the H-34. You know, uh, last week we did the Bell 47, and we're going to move into some bigger and more in interesting helicopters and in terms of uh, combat, moving away from kind of the rudimentary designs into the more sophisticated airplanes. But first, I need to recognize my Sagagesis, Sagagesis. Sagagis, Sagagis assistant, is that a good one? No, not even close. Greg says, well, my sagacious assistant. I got it, there it was there, Greg said it. Uh, and uh, my assistant, Greg Kenny. Today we are doing President's Day weekend, so hence the garb. Hmm, Greg, I will contemplate the helicopters. But I'm gonna go ahead and get this off. I actually got Greg to smile on that one, he smiled. If you'll notice, I did get my ears lowered this week, which was nice. And today we're gonna go down the Sikorsky, the H-34. Now there were a ton of variants on this helicopter and like what we've been doing in the past, we have a lot of variations. We're gonna do an overview of the type. So today we're gonna walk down, uh, as I said, H-34 helicopter lane. Now this aircraft here was um, the brainchild and the company uh, Sikorsky which was f uh, founded by Igor Sikorsky in 1923. Can you believe that, Greg? 1923. Uh, went all the way to, went through a couple of different ownership changes in 2015 and ended up with Lockheed Martin, which is where it exists today as a manufacturer. Uh, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, but the bureau number on this airplane for you affectionados at home who are following some of these airframes, the bureau number is 154 895. We're going to tell you why that's significant in a bit. Now, this aircraft uh, first flew in 1954. It was introduced in 1954, and it was produced by from 1954 to 1970. There were 2,108 uh, built. It was also built um, under the turbo, uh, the turbo shaft version of this had a turbine in it. And by the English, it was called the Wessex. The turbine version of this has a more pronounced nose, and you can actually see the exhaust on it, and that's the Wessex. This had that 1820 right radial engine in it, which was a reciprocating engine, you know, piston-powered engine, so uh, couldn't be more different in terms of horsepower and things of that nature. The Wessex had a, a lot more horsepower and uh, was a natural progression of this. But in this type, uh, flew all the way out or was produced from 1954 to 1970, as I said. The, this is a upgunned or a larger version. I'll pick this up. You can see how big this is with me um, standing next to it. Greg can throw up a um, the plan view. And I don't want to, this is one of the more diminutive models Greg has given me. I'm afraid I'm going to break this one. But as you can see, you have a power plant, power plant up there, crew, we're gonna talk about that in a bit. Um, and then you had whatever it was carrying back in there. It could carry 12 troops or cargo. Uh, it was also used for uh, anti-submarine warfare. And it was also used as a VIP. But it had a, you can see, a very large stance, fixed gear. Crew is up high, so it has very good visibility. Now, the thing about this was it went into uh, service with the French, and they actually had some experience with this aircraft in Indochina. They uh, had a number of problems with it due to ground fire. The aircraft was susceptible to ground fire. You can imagine, we talked about this, this engine's right up in the nose. So if somebody's shooting at it, you could hit that engine fairly easily. It did, Greg, it colored something, and that was, it colored the deployment of the United States Army of this helicopter into Vietnam. It was with, primarily with the Navy and the United States Marine Corps that this helicopter saw combat in Vietnam. The helicopters will carry Marines and supplies from ship to shore, bypassing areas that normally would be fortified and deploying well inland. The Boxer rendezvous with its copters. First to come aboard is the HUS, a light transport helicopter. 
This versatile aircraft carries 12 troops or eight litters on a normal mission. It also is flown by the Navy, the Army, the Coast Guard, and commercial operators. The deck crews secure the aircraft for the night. Rotor blades and tail pylons are folded, and tie-down gear is pulled taut. Now, the interesting thing is this livery on this particular helicopter, this is actually the VMM-362, the Ugly Angels, Greg, the Ugly Angels. And this was the first Marine uh, helicopter unit uh, into, and one of the very early units into Vietnam. They now, interesting Fred, fun fact, they operate the Osprey, Greg. They're part of the third marine aircraft wing and they operate the osprey but at that time they were one of the first into vietnam with with a rotary ring with this helicopter now the this also has the distinction is when it went into combat it had it was one of the first and i didn't can't really see how this would have been effective but it was one of the first helicopter gunships with the tk1 kit which was two m60 machine guns and two 2.75 inch rocket pods. And so it was actually tested as a gunship. But I said the Army didn't like it because they were nervous about ground fire, so it never saw extended combat. Now it did combat. It did go into use with the South Vietnamese uh, forces, but due to spare parts shortages, they didn't operate it very much. And as I said, the Navy used it for uh, anti-submarine and SAR search and rescue and, and things of that nature. Now. There's an interesting term, Greg. It's called uh, cut me a hus or get me a hus. And you know what that means? That is a Marine term for get me some help. And that actually term was coined from these aircraft. And that, that term actually lived on in the United States Marine Corps when they were act, asking for help or asking for a dust off on a helicopter after this type was retired. Um, it also was uh, featured in a Vietnam film or a journalism essay called One Ride with Yankee Papa. And that was a uh, documentary that was done where a bunch of these got, uh, there's no other better technical term than this, Greg, to say they got the, the heck shot out of them. They, they got shot up really bad. And that was a photo, photojournalistic essay of this type. The last flight of this helicopter uh, in the United States Marine Corps was in September of 1973. If you can believe that, that was, and then they were sent off into history. And so today I wanna move on to my stage two. And of course, Greg is continuing to torture me with soda. Now I, I made an, uh, an observation on this when uh, he, Greg keeps these in like a hermetically sealed refrigerator, you know, and he brings one out with quite great fanfare and gives it to me. And I did notice on this one, I looked at the label, this is another Rocket Fizz product from the completely nasty and disgusting Atomic Apocalypse Lemonade, whatever you gave me. That was something, that was pretty nasty. This one today, and this is, because it looks like a giant grasshopper, this is grass soda. Why else? Why else would we? I want to run out and get this right now, Greg. Now this one again, the um, the people who made this have a great sense of humor. Greg maybe can throw the label up. It says mowed and bottled in the USA. Greg, all right, this is going to be, I think, a little bit of torture, but in honor of the what they call the giant grasshopper, I'm going to go ahead and take a shot at this. Now, what we're gonna do with this one is uh, we're gonna salute all of those Marine helicopter squadrons. Again, you can see where the crew is in this. Uh, this was, you had to be double tough to fly one of these. And uh, all of those early gunship and helicopter crews in Vietnam, ultimately with Air Mobile and the Air Cavalry, helicopters would go far and wide in the United States military and, and would become an integral part but in those early days, they were proving all this out. This particular aircraft 
the uh, H-34 was one of those types that was a proving ground for A everything. typical day for members of a Marine medium helicopter squadron in Vietnam usually starts quietly, but rarely continues that way. This UH-34 with pilot, co-pilot, crew chief, and gunner aboard is on medevac assignment, and the missions will include mercy flights for injured Vietnamese civilians as well as wounded American and Vietnamese fighting men. In the air, the crew chief keeps constantly alert to advise the pilot of any ground fire he may see or of any other conditions below them which the pilot might need to know. When there are passengers, he must place them in positions which help maintain the balance of the ship and give them a warning signal when it's time to land. As the chopper approaches the landing zone, the crew chief has to be alert for incoming fire and be ready to shoot back. The landing zone is hot and the chopper can't stay long on the ground. Combat wounded are carried to the helicopter. And next stop is another mercy mission for the Vietnamese, this time involving women and children. Again, the crew chief has his work cut out for him. In addition to responsibility for the security of the craft while it's in a landing zone, he finds he must also calm frightened Vietnamese passengers. Sometimes he must feed a crying child, or on occasion, even assist at childbirth. On final return to their base, the aircraft must be readied for new missions. They come day and night in Vietnam. The number of sorties flown by Marine helicopters is already in the tens of thousands. Countless lives, both Vietnamese and American, have been saved by quick, efficient medevac. Marine crews from 18-year-old PFCs through seasoned master sergeants and commissioned officers know the medevac missions are integral elements of the combat action and civic action vital to the successful termination of this conflict. And it actually even colors the uh, tilt rotor, the Osprey operations today. So to uh, VMM, VMM 362, the Ugly Angels, and uh, all those folks that were operating in Vietnam early in the war, I am going to take one for the team and have my grass soda. Oh, the aroma of cut grass. Nothing better in soda. You know, Greg, that's, that's not as disgusting. That's not, like, terrible. Uh, you know, it's not something I would bring home. It's kind of in the middle. But for all of those folks in the salute, I'll take one more. Mm. Nothing says a tribute like cut grass soda, as I say. But I'm going to go ahead and, and put that down there and not have that spill, hopefully. But the... Um, this aircraft went into civilian use. It was used, uh, the turbine version has been used quite a bit. Now, the other interesting thing with this uh, helicopter, Fred Fun Fact, Fred Fun Fact, and that is, you know, last week we talked about the NASA crash with the astronaut crashing uh, one of the Bell 47s. Let's keep on the space program with this one. Uh, the H-34 was the recovery program for the Mercury Redstone project, you know, with the Mercury astronauts. And this, there is footage, I'm sure Greg can find it, of a H-34 trying to hook up to Liberty Bell 7. Gus Grissom was in the capsule. The emergency hatch blew, flooded the castle capsule. Gus Grissom nearly drowned in that, and there was a huge controversy for many years that they thought that he had actually initiated the hatch being blown, that he panicked and blew the hatch. They recovered the capsule in 1999, and it was found that um, through a forensic analysis that he had not done that. He had always maintained that uh, he was killed later in the Apollo program and the pad fire, but he had always ma maintained that he had not uh, blown the hatch, and the hatch blew out. One of the design things about those astronauts being killed in that Apollo uh, accident on the pad was the hatch opened in. It was one of the things that they changed from the Mercury program, and it actually contributed to their demise, which is kind of ironic with Gus Grissom getting caught in that. It was a terrible day for the space program when we lost those astronauts. But this type, it could lift a empty 
uh, mercury capsule, but the one full of seawater, they had to cut it loose, and it stayed on the bottom of the ocean until 1999. Now let's talk about, I, I talked about this particular type, 154895 is the bureau number. It was built, and when Greg does a walk around, you can see it's actually built as a seahorse, which is an anti-submarine version of the aircraft. It found its livery into this VMM-362, and uh, we have kept that. The aircraft has been restored. It, is, it sits outside most of the time, but it's in pretty good condition, although I can tell you I can certainly understand uh, why they had challenges with this. Uh, as Greg knows, we've had a lot of corrosion uh, issues with this helicopter because of there's a lot of magnesium and titanium alloy on the helicopter and it just doesn't sit well. So we're constantly doing a, a lot of work on it. But if you're an ugly angel, you know, they operate the Osprey. Maybe we could get them to bring one up and park it on the ramp. You know what they could do is, you know, the guy we haven't heard from is Josh Gates, my, my hero, Josh Gates, who's never wished me. Uh, I've been waiting. It's what, seven months for my happy birthday, Greg? It hasn't happened. So maybe they could bring uh, Josh Gates up. But the ugly angels, if you're ever in our neck of the woods, stop by at the museum. We'd love to see you. But this type uh, was really one of the first of the, um, of the kind of modern helicopters where they were starting to do uh, air assault, gunships, uh, and attack versions. Of course, that would move into another helicopter that's coming up real soon, which is the UH-1, the Huey helicopter, which we're going to get into. But this is a very interesting version of early engineering. Now, if you are at home and you need to know when Warbird Wednesday comes on, right? You could set your, I don't know that has a date function, but Greg, maybe we could figure that out. But you could set the date function to see Warbird Wednesday. Everyone wants this really cool altimeter clock. And on top of that, Greg, they could sign their membership form from the Palm Springs Air Museum. Is that a clever amount of embedded marketing? You just can't train this. We just embedded it in there. So get out and to our website and pick up one of these very cool clocks, Greg. You should get out and get one of those. Uh, ask Jason to send you one. He'll happily do it. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. I want to thank you for joining us for this episode. Remember, like us on YouTube, subscribe, send the videos to an aviation aficionado. Maybe you can join the uh, Warbird Wednesday fan club. We'd love to have you do that. Like us on Facebook. And remember, we cannot restore these airplanes without your donations. So please hit that donation button. We can really use it. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a great day.